Welcome everyone. Today, in uh, as part of the Meet the Scholar series, we have Professor Costas Marquides from LBS joining us. And uh, uh, I will be moderating and interviewing him. I'm Nel Dutt from Bocconi. Uh, and to help me out, we have Yao Albino Pimentel from CBS uh, and Samina Karim, the SDR uh, division chair, to, to jump in at the end, ask questions and take over in case my internet crashes. So of course, Professor Marquides doesn't really need an introduction, but for those of us that might be less familiar with his huge body of work, uh, a bit of an overview. So Professor Marquides is the Robert B. Bauman Chair in Strategic Leadership at London Business School, and he's been at LBS since 1990. So something interesting that we don't see uh, today, somebody doing their whole career, uh, or their career so far at the same university. Uh, and he got his DBA in 1990 from Harvard Business School, so 30 years ago. Um, his research interests span many areas. Uh, I, I knew his work best for corporate strategy and diversification, but he's also done work on business models, on disruptive innovation, and more recently on social innovation. Uh, and the impact of this work is immense. His Google Scholar suggests he has almost 14,000 citations. Uh, that's a number that, uh, at least for a junior scholar, is unfathomable, with an H index of 42. Um, he's also quite interesting because he's written several books. Uh, the one that I knew best was Fast Second with Paul Jarosky, uh, but he has several other books, including Diversing, Diversification, Refocusing, and Economic Performance, All the Right Moves, A Guide to Crafting a Breakthrough Strategy, uh, and I believe this book was also nominated for an award, uh, The Future of the Multinational Company, uh, co-authored with Julian Birkinshaw, uh, and several more. Let's talk about his awards and achievements, uh, starting from his undergraduate days, where he managed to finish his bachelor's and his master's degree within two years of each other, uh, and to graduate with the highest honors, summa cum laude Phi Beta Kappa from Boston University. This was followed by a fellowship from Harvard Business School in the last year of his study. Uh, and since becoming a professor, he's consistently won several teaching and innovation and learning awards since 97, and of course, the Robert Bauman Chair in 2001. Costas has also served on the editorial review boards of several of our illustrious journals, Strategic Management Journal, AMJ, uh, Journal of Strategy and Management, uh, Academy of Management Perspectives, as well as a more managerially focused journal, Sloan Management Review. He's also done a lot of service in other ways. So he's been the department chair uh, of his department at London Business School, not once, but twice. He's also the director, the faculty director of executive education at London Business School. Uh, he's the chair for the SMS uh, virtual conference, now virtual conference, I should say, in London this year and was part of the board of directors of SMS from 2013 to 2016. Uh, and lastly, he's very interested in interacting with uh, industry leaders and producing managerially relevant research. Uh, and we see this as he's been to the World Economic Forum in Davos five times, uh, and generally focused more on uh, such conferences. So with that introduction, I will stop sharing my screen and we will return to, uh, we'll start our interview with Professor Marquitas. More narrowly than, uh, than uh, um, let me, it says here the meeting is being recorded, okay, uh, than uh, I did in my early years. The second thing I've seen in our evolution of the field is that there's been tremendous emphasis now on methodolog methodological record. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you need to be good in methods and, and data crunching and methodologies now to develop uh, an academic rigorous paper and get it published in the journals. Whereas I think when I started my career, it was more theoretical, more it didn't have to have the rigorous empirical part that it has now. So all our younger colleagues now really, really have to spend a lot of time learning methods, learning Econometrics, whatever they, 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 they want, and, and be good in, in, in analyzing data uh, and so on. And then the, 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 the third thing you've seen is that uh, despite the proliferation of journals in our field, I mean, I remember 1991, 92, when Mitch Koza 
who was professor at, at INSEAD, called me and said, oh, we're thinking of starting a new journal course that's called Organization Science, and what do you think of it? And I thought it was a terrible idea at the time because I thought we already have a bloody journal. Why do we need another one? Anyway, but you know, the proliferation of all these journals is one, but still, there's so many more people trying to publish now that it's been a very, very competitive, um, it's become very, very competitive. I mean, I think the average time to get a, 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 an article published now is three, three and a half years and so on. And I think that has implications on our younger colleagues on how, how patient they could be with their research, but also how they manage their careers so that in a seven year clock, they have enough publications to get tenure. It's much more competitive now. So a quick follow-up question from Samina. Would you also agree that, uh, not from Samina, from Anira, sorry. <laughs> uh, would you also agree that in terms of the focus, the field has also broadened? So it used to be that central questions were in corporate and competitive strategy. Uh, and while still important now, there's, uh, there's no, they're no longer the exclusive areas of research in our field. I totally agree with that. Much, much broader. Uh, you know, you see in our field now people from psychology, sociology, history, economics, and so on, general management, much broad. The kind of things that I teach in my strategy core course at London Business School, my colleagues in the OB department, organizational behavior, complain all the time saying, oh, that is the intellectual territory of OB. Why are you teaching that in strategy? Because I think strategy has brought in as a field as well, and it encompasses uh, ideas and thoughts that come from other different disciplines now. Very much so, yeah. So this is a good time to ask you about your own research trajectory, because you have research that fits into four different areas. Uh, yeah. And I just went through the process of writing my tenure statement, which is now submitted, which is great. But if I had four areas, you know, I would have been told, uh oh, do something different. Four is too many. So, so what, you know, wh how did you, what was your path yeah. getting through these four areas and yeah. sort of give well, us some ideas how we can also be so broad? <laughs> I wish that as a strategy professor, I could say that I had a strategy that <laughs> told me I'm going to go from A to B to C, but it never happens like that. You know, I did my dissertation on diversification. Uh, I, I remember at the time uh, I, I collected a lot of data. It was a large sample econometric study, primarily because one member of my committee was uh, Richard Caves, who was professor of economics, uh, uh, the late Richard Caves now, professor of economics at, uh, in, the, in the economics department of Harvard. And he kind of guided me in that direction which was unusual for a Harvard DBA. I mean, let's face it, I don't have a PhD from Harvard. I have a DBA. It was the DBAs at the time were used to doing more field-based research. So for me, it was unusual to do a large sample quantitative study. Um, it allowed me to get quite a few academic publications, but you know, after about six, seven, eight years of doing that work, you, I got bored, I don't know about you guys, but I got bored about, maybe because the field of diversification had itself mature, you know, we started, to, it became really hot as a topic back in the early 70s with uh, Richard Rummel's dissertation work. And, you know, for the next 20 years, it was a very popular topic in, in strategy. I got onto it, I published my work, but I reached a stage where, you know, I felt that, I couldn't think of any interesting research questions for me to get excited about, you know. And as if by accident, I, I gravitated uh, primarily through my teaching into this idea of, uh, of uh, strategic innovation um, and, you know, which was about repositioning the firm in its industry environment. And that by itself got me working with the, the late Paul Jarosky, who was a professor of IO economics at the London Business School. He led to a lot of uh, collaborative work, a book, uh, we, we published a book together and so on. But then it was at that time when disruptive innovation from Clay Christensen was coming up. And since I was working on what I thought uh, was disruptive innovation, it was about uh, business model innovation. Uh, this is how I define strategic innovation. I naturally gravitated into strategic innovation, into business model innovation, and some of my later work is in that. 
But then, you know, uh, to give credit to Anita when she was on sabbatical at London Business School, she encouraged me to think in terms of how can I use some of these insights from business and innovation to think about social innovation and how can we solve social problems and, 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 and uh, diffuse innovations that solve social problems. And that led me into that kind of trajectory. So again, it all sounds like there's been a plan behind all of this and I moved from it, but it really it's uh, circumstances and uh, a confluence of who I ran into in terms of academic uh, colleagues and what I was teaching at the time, plus my own interests. I seem to find many, many things interesting and my, my maybe tendency to get bored after five, six years with one topic and forcing myself to jump into different topics. Keep in mind, I mean, it's been 30 years. So, you know, you just written your tenure statement, give it another 20 years, and then you may jump into four different topics as well. Oh, I would like to jump into four different topics now. <laughs> I'm just controlling myself. Um, so uh, this is a good time to also let you all uh, give you a reminder of the format, because I see Anita is breaking the rules and constantly asking questions. Uh, and the way that we're going to do it is to have a structured Q&A for the first hour and then have open questions from the audience uh, for the second hour. But when your questions are relevant, I will bring them into the structured Q&A because I'm sure we're going to run out of time before Costas has answered all of your questions. So yes, Anita yeah, is definitely yeah. allowed to break the rules. And I've already incorporated one of her questions. Yeah but I realized that I hadn't actually explained the format to, to, to you guys. You should teach us the trick of listening to me and at the same time talking and at the same time looking at the chat uh, function because I've tried it in my teaching and it led to a big mess. Yeah, you don't do anything really well. That's, uh, that's the trick, <laughs> but you do everything a little bit. A new definition of ambidexterity. You don't yeah. do anything well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so on these lines of sort of trying to doing different things and experimenting with different ways of staying engaged in our work, uh, another way in which you are unique is uh, in the fact that you've written books and you've written several books. Um, so again, how did you, what happened to make you write your first book? Uh, any advice for yeah. those of us that might be thinking about this? Is it good career advice at this point? Anything on those lines? Well, I remember about uh, four weeks ago, I attended the, the, the Meet the Scholar session by Kathy Eisenhardt. And she basically made the argument that as we go through our careers, all of us need to find something in addition to publishing academic articles. And she mentioned books. And I think for me, that was one avenue away from just academic articles. I mean, I think, first of all, this should be a personal choice. I'm not encouraging our younger colleagues to just move into books and so on. For me, it was very, very personally rewarding, and I'll tell you why. But, you know, different people have different preferences. Some stay within just the academic uh, field, and they do that very, very well. That's fine. Others do what I do, and if they are happy with that, I think that's fine. I'll tell you why I enjoy writing books. Uh, for me, a book is not, uh, as an academic, first of all, I believe firmly that there's nothing new out there. There's really nothing new that you could say. It's out, we've published about almost everything and it's a matter of finding it out there. However, I think as academics, we have tendency to be very, very focused in our field and publish in a very narrow way. So it's, it's helpful sometimes for someone to step back and you know, take a big picture of you and take from the insights of many other people and synthesize it into something that the managerial audience will find useful. And that's what I do. I don't pretend that any of my books have anything new in it. It's just that I take research findings and ideas from other people. I kind of recombine them into what I think is something beautiful. And I write them down in a language that the other people would find useful. Um, I enjoy doing that. I find it a great Do you enjoy, learning. sorry to interrupt, but do you enjoy all of that? Or is there something about that process that's really enjoyable to you and it makes doing the rest of it worthwhile? First of all, 
it is difficult, okay? I don't want to give yeah. them, it is difficult, especially if you are at the same time trying to write an academic article. I've just gone through the process over the last four months of writing another book uh, while trying to write an academic article. It really is a different mindset and a different way of framing things, of writing things. And if you jump from one to the other, I mean, it takes two or three days to get into one way of thinking, one way of writing. And if you jump to the other, it takes another two or three days to do it. And if you jump from one to the other all the time, it's very, very inefficient. So it, it is a very different process from writing an academic article. What I enjoy to, uh, in this process of book writing is that I learn a lot. When I read an academic article, many times I say, yeah, that's an interesting idea and I think I learned. But it's only when I try to take that academic article and combine it with many, many other academic articles that some of the ideas really hit me. It's like, ah, now I know what they really meant. Now I know how that fits and so on. So for me, the enjoyable part is that it's a learning process for me. And I enjoy taking these academic insights and taking them into the classroom because the students themselves, they also, even when you give them an SMJ or an AMJ to read, you know, I don't think they get the most out of it as opposed to you coming in and saying, you know, if you take that idea and that idea and that idea and you put it together, this is what you get. I think they find that enlightening. This is what I find good with book writing. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you mentioned as part of your motivation to write books is to reach out to a managerial audience. Yeah. Uh, and so when did you decide this was something important? Uh, and then how did you go about sort of sharpening those skills? Yeah, again, from the very beginning, I mean, it, it's a function of what school I ended up with. You know, when I finished my DBA, I had, uh, you know, two or three offers here and there. And I, again, don't ask me why I chose London Business School. Uh, and London Business, it's a unique school. It's a very unique school in the sense that uh, it has evolved over the last 30 years away from what I'm going to describe now, more to the American US model. But when I joined, London Business School was uh, a school that placed a heavy emphasis, not only on research, but also on teaching and on being credible to managers. So they wanted us to go out and, you know, talk at conferences, talk to managers, teach, teach executive education, talk to the press, talk to the BBC, make our voice known and so on. So, you know, I was raised in a way in a school that values book writing that values the managerial attention. So it was natural for me to gravitate into that. And I think that's an important point to emphasize for our younger colleagues. What, you have to be careful what school you end up with and what that school values, because there's nothing worse for you to end up at a place where the, the values of the school do not fit your values. You know, uh, you'd be miserable, you're not gonna enjoy it and you know, and so on. So again, by luck, I ended up at a school that values the teaching and the managerial relevance. And from the very beginning, you know, I mean, once I started, year one, you know, the emphasis was, okay, Costa, you're writing for AMJ, you're writing for SMJ, but how about HBR? How about the book? You know, it was part of my annual evaluation process. It was part of the discussions in the corridors with my colleagues. So I got socialized into having, uh, thinking that I have to publish for the managerial audience. And, you know, you get positive reinforcement. If you write a good book and, you know, people tell you, oh, I read your book, it's very, very nice. You get that immediate feedback from uh, managerial audiences, which we don't get that often in our uh, academic <laughs> publications. So, you know, you, you, you naturally, once you get that positive feedback, you naturally do a little bit more of it. So it sounds like your evolution sort of shadowed very closely with LBS's co-evolution. And so yeah. that's why you were able to stay there. Uh, but this is a slightly controversial question. Were you ever at any point thinking about leaving uh, and sort of what persuaded you to stay? Yeah. Look, I think all of us at a certain stage in our evolution, and I, I will say right about when you're about to get tenure or the first few years after that, because you are probably most research productive at the time, you get noticed by other schools and they, they come knocking and they come, would you like to join us and so on. And I, you know, I had, you know, approaches by other schools uh, to move and so on. Um, 
I didn't move, number one, because I, I felt valued at my institution for what I was doing. Uh, and, and, you know, I was enjoying what I was doing. I was having success in what I was doing. I didn't want to move. And secondly, because I really enjoyed, you know, the London experience, being in London. It's, it's a beautiful cosmopolitan city. I enjoyed living there. I, you know, I come from Cyprus. It was close to my home country to come and see my parents. So it was a natural home for me. And I never really, I mean, I interviewed with a couple of places, but uh, I never really took it seriously, moving away from London Museum. I mean, again, I'm not suggesting, I'm not recommending that strategy to all of my younger colleagues. I mean, they have to make up their own mind what's best for them. But I thought it was, it was a good, strategy on my part to stay within the London Business School uh, premise. So one of the things that's come up a few times is uh, your interest in teaching and you won several awards for it. It's clearly one of the ways in which you and London Business School are a good fit. Again, yeah. what any insights over the last 30 years of what you've observed and sort of things that junior faculty PhD students should think about as they prepare to go out and teach those big bad MBAs. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've, I've given several presentations at the Academy of Management at uh, PhD workshops or junior faculty workshops. Laundry list, these are the 20 things you need to do to be an excellent teacher. And, you know, I think most of our colleagues know what it takes to be, a, you know, the usual stuff like empathy to the audience and be prepared and, you know, be dynamic and so on. But, you know, the one thing that my guiding principle has always been that uh, our goal should not be to teach people, you know, that's, that's a low bar to teach people, you know, if you want to teach someone, and give them a book, let them read it of their own time. I think we should inspire people. We are really believe we should inspire them into thinking differently. We should inspire them into having greater ambitions for, for, from the ones they had when they joined the school. We should inspire them to be good citizens, not just good business people and so on. So that's what I'm trying to do with my students and with the senior executives that I teach, you know, is to challenge them to think more, you know, ambitiously, you know, come on guys. I mean, think of it. I think, for example, that capitalism and business has created so much value for society over the last 200 years who have helped improve society in so many ways uh, and yet business people are the number one you know being blamed for all the nasty things that happen in the world you know uh, and so on and so forth and i think there is there's something wrong there there's something wrong why is that on the one hand we do so much good for society and at the same time everybody thinks of us in su such low terms so you know my family members, my brother is an engineer and he's, he has still not excused me or forgiven me for get, getting into management. He thinks I betrayed the family, you know, that I'm doing such negative things, you know, destroying the environment. You know, I don't know how I'm destroying the environment, but there you have it. I'm destroying the environment and so on. And I think we need to set higher uh, standards for our students. And that's what I'm trying to do. And, you know, as long as you're natural in the classroom, as long as you relate to human beings one to one, as long as you think of them as like you, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm staring at the participants here and I'm saying, my God, how can I keep them awake here for the next two hours? Because two hours sitting there listening to my mambo jumbo, I wouldn't like to sit here and listening to me for two hours. What can I do here to make them engage or at least not fall asleep on me and maybe get something out of this session? I mean, as long as you have that perspective, ideas come to you, what you can do in the classroom and how you can teach and so on. And I think that that's, that's the secret recipe. But are there any specific ways in which you differentiate between executive students and MBAs or, or even levels below MBA? Yeah, the MBAs, you have to go deeper into whatever you're saying. I mean, if you, if you okay. make a, pro, a, a, a proclamation, like for example, uh, I'm teaching disruption and I'm saying, how should you frame disruption as a threat or as an opportunity? And you know, the answer is, I suppose, a threat and an opportunity. In an executive audience, you know, I think most people would be happy with that and how they can apply it. MBAs will say, why? What's the difference between 
framing it as a threat or an opportunity. And how come you're coming up with such an insight and telling me that? And that's when you say, by the way, this is the PhD thesis of Clark Gilbert, the Harvard Business School. You look yeah. at the newspaper business, he did this, he did that, you know. So with an MBA audience, you have to go deeper into some of these things and explain to them uh, a little bit more why and, uh, and what is it that you're telling them. With an executive audience, they are more interested not only in the idea, but in the how-to. It's like, all right, man, you told me it's not a threat, it's a threat and an opportunity. How, what, what does that imply for me in my company? What do I do other than just stand in front of my people and say, it's a threat and an opportunity. What else do I have to do to really get into their psyche that it's a threat and an opportunity? So there's more emphasis on the how-to with an executive audience. Interesting. I, um, I, I mean, the, the, the attention span of an executive audience is also shorter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I found. I mean, you know, so you have to, you know, instead of going, instead of talking about five topics in a session and go yeah. deep in them, you talk about 20 sessions in a session and you use a lot of more stories, a lot of more examples and things like that. Hmm. Good to know. Okay, yeah. I'm going to switch tracks a little bit. No, this is, it's actually making me think of uh, ideas for research, but anyway, yeah. not my interview. We'll keep going. Uh, so one of the things that's prominent in your CV is the, is the amount of service you've done uh, and there's sort of three levels of it. There's to your department, there's to the field at large, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the SMS uh, conference this year. Let's start to your department. So most people that have been department chair swear that they're never gonna do it again. That's uh, what I did at the beginning of my department chair. <laughs> so, so yes, how did, how did you agree to do it a second time? And sort of at what point in their career should someone even think about taking on this responsibility? They forced me into it, Nell. They forced me into it. You should have seen me before I became department chair. I had long hair like you, you know. <laughs> uh, look, I, again, this is my, my belief. I think that uh, as, as an academic, one of the most important things you can do is to inspire us as students to go out and make a difference. I think the second best I'm not going to say publish and come up with great ideas. I think that's the third best. The second best is to make people around you better than you and better at what they do. I, I, I enjoy making people or helping people become better at what they do. All right. I, you know, I mean, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to go and, you know, cut off my hands trying to help other people. But you'll be surprised most of the time we can help other human beings without really suffering a lot or without sacrificing a lot. As because of our position, because of our seniority, because of our more uh, experience and so on, uh, the, the cost of providing advice of helping other people to us is much, much smaller than we think and so on. So, you know, I, I became department chair very young uh, in the sense that I joined London Business School in 1990 1998, I got tenure, which is a story in itself because in the English educational system, we do not have tenure. But anyway, I got tenure. They told me I can never fire you anymore. Uh, uh, and just then, when they said that, they said, now you become the department chair. It's like asking a recently tenured person who just became associate professor to become a uh, department chair. First of all, this will never happen in today's world. Never, never, ever. And secondly, if, it, if anybody is asked at that stage of their career to, be, uh, to become department chair, they should say no 100% of the time. No, no, no. Uh, now, but like I said, I come from a different age. I come from a different kind of school. For me, it was normal to be asked to become department chair. Uh, I mean, I was running executive programs at London Business School three years into my Position along with so again, we're never gonna ask uh, younger colleagues now to even think about executive education until after tenure. I was doing it and I was program director three years into my position at London Business School. So I became department chair. And what you find you really did, what I discovered was that the, the, the satisfaction or the pleasure I was getting out of helping you know my colleagues in what they were doing was. It was really enormous. I'm, I'm not trying to be hooky here or pretending. I mean, I really loved helping. I really loved it when people would come into my office with a problem and they would leave 
with a smile on their face because they saw we solved the problem and so on. So I enjoyed that part of being department chair. What I did not enjoy was, you know, continuous, you know, daily uh, disturbances. You know, people want piece of your time, five minutes here, 10 minutes there, 15 minutes there, writing reports, writing evaluations, you know, and it kills off a lot of your focus on, on research and writing and so on. But I really enjoy, you know, being department chair. I was asked to do it a second time later. I did it. I enjoyed it as much. Uh, you know, but now, you know, if we have enough other senior faculty at the school to, you know, pass on the baton and so on. Uh, but I, I enjoyed the process uh, of being department chair. Okay, so this is a counter example to every other story. So yeah. I remember it. <laughs> then I tell you the best advice I give to people and they never believe me when they join me. It's always to say, look, we are not in the business of publishing. I always say this to people and say, yeah, yeah, you'd say that. What kind of BS is that? And you got tenure. That's why you say that. We, are, we really are not. I really want people to get this point because I always say, look, it's like when you teach strategy, I always tell people, you're not in the business of maximizing shareholder value. That's not your goal. What, you know what your goal is? Your goal is to produce products and services that consumers love, that make the world a better place. And if you do that, a byproduct of that will be making money. You will maximize share for the value, but that's not the goal. Don't focus on that because if you focus on that, you will end up doing stupid things, illegal things, immoral things, just to maximize share for the value. Focus on producing the best products, the best service. The same with us as academics. When we come in and we focus on publish, I have to publish, I have to, pub, I have to get five, six, seven publications to get tenure. It does something to the brain. And, and that's not the goal. The goal is, come up with wonderful ideas, really. We're in the business of coming up with ideas that improve the world and so on. And if you do that, you will end up with good publications, trust me. So you try to you know, you encourage people to change their mindset as to what the goal is. And I, I've been saying that for 30 years now, and all my colleagues will say, yeah, yeah, we don't believe that BS, but I really think it's a very, very important mindset for younger people to have. The importance of focusing on, you know, don't, don't, don't focus on publications. It's gonna, it's gonna make you miserable. Just focus on ideas. So are you able, you can't convince your junior colleagues, uh, but what about doctoral students? Are you able to convince them of this value? Well, yes and no, but you know, there is another requirement there with the, the PhD student, which is you have to demo, a PhD is not only coming up with great ideas or demonstrating the great idea. It's also, you have to demonstrate other capabilities, including the data crunching methodology, data collection, data cleaning, you know, lots of other things. So, you know, I, I, and you have to do that within a very specific period of time. So, uh, you know, yes, focus on, pop, on the great ideas, but at the same time, demonstrate the other capabilities. And, you know, I think PhD is a slightly, slightly different little case, in my opinion, that, you know, I don't want to be put a necessary pressure on the PhDs by putting too many other demands or requirements or standards on them. It's true. I actually have to say, at the point where I figured out my dissertation was not going to be the only work that I did, it became a lot easier to work on it. Yeah, of course. And so, course. you know. Yeah. 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 Dissertation is just one so step in a journey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Speaking of PhD students, we have a question from Nina, who I guess you're not seeing these days because you're not going to the office. Uh, but she'd like to know, so you've talked a lot about inspiring your students, your colleagues, what inspires you and what excites you uh, in your academic career? Again, I'm inspired by ideas. That's one thing. I'm, I'm inspired. I really am. You know, when you, because we, this is what we do on a daily basis. We read, we talk with people, we exchange ideas, you know, and I'm, I'm, it, it's inter I, I always look for the aha moment. What is the aha? What is the counterintuitive idea that, that this was? So I, that inspires me. Uh, and it's not only academics that come up with aha moments, by the way. I mean, my, my favorite author is Malcolm Gladwell because, you know, not only does he write very, very well, not only does he have good stories, but I think he has ideas that 
we may not agree with them, we may argue with, but there are ideas that at least we'll argue about and have a conversation about and so on. So ideas inspire me. I'm inspired, you know, I, I have to say we have certain colleagues in the academy that are really inspiring. They are inspiring not only because of their ideas, but they are inspiring because of the service they provide to the community and because, you know, of, of, of the of their track record let's put it like this i mean again i don't want to put uh, people on the spot here but if you look for example at anita and i mean you you cannot fail but be inspired by the the work that she has done over the last 30 years it's inspiring to see people that have the same amount of time as you the same demands on their time and yet mm -hmm. produce 10 times the articles as you so you say wow there must be something here that you know you should look and admire um, okay, so we've talked a little bit about your uh, mentoring of uh, students uh, in terms of our field at large, having served on the boards of all of these uh, different journals, as well as Sloan Management Review, sort of what types of, uh, what types of time demands do, do those activities put on you? When should we think about getting involved with these activities? Yeah. Uh, and when should we say no? Okay. First, I think it's the wrong framing to say it's a time demanding exercise and you have to do it, but when should we say that? I think, uh, first of all, it's a service to the community. They, they do it to us, you know, they review our papers and they provide us with feedback. I think it's only fair that, uh, you know, we do the same thing. But, you know, again, serving on the boards, I, I have not been very active. I've been on the editorial boards and, you know, AMJ, SMJ, in the early days, they will send me six, seven, eight articles every year and so on. So I don't think, I don't pretend I had a heavy load, but it's a learning experience. You keep up to speed, up to speed with, the, with the, the, the latest thinking. When you read an article, to you're, you're trying to review an article, you're at the cutting edge of whatever that author is writing. And it, it's, it's, it, it's a learning process for you. I enjoy that. Or when you want to do a good review, sometimes you have to go and read the, some of the other works that the authors are referencing in their papers and so you learn about some other work so it's forcing you on average i will spend two days doing a review you know i will read an article very quickly the first time get a view of what's happening you know maybe if there are points in it that i don't know very well i'll go and re read the references and so on and then come back and read it more carefully and then sit down and write the review so you know it's a learning process. If you have to spend two days doing that on a, and you do it six, seven times a year for two, three journals and so on, it is a learning process. I encourage my colleagues to do it as quickly as they can. You know, I don't think, oh, wait until you get tenure and then you do it because I don't see it as a time uh, wasting exercise. It's, it's an investment. It's an investment that can only help you. So if uh, the editors reach out to you early on in your career, by all means, you know, review for the journals, and if you do a good job, they will put you on the other editorial boards uh, early on. You learn, and it's also, it's good for your career, you know, in the sense that come tenure time, if you have on your CV that the fact that you are on the editorial board of prominent journals, or you've done, you know, uh, uh, reviews, you may not be on the editorial board, but you're doing ad hoc reviews, that's good. It, it, may, it counts towards... Uh, uh, your, your, your promotion and so on. So I think it's good service to the community. I think it's a learning experience. I think you can manage it. I mean, let's not be silly here. I mean, I've said no to the journals before when maybe a request may come at a bad time, when you're very busy, when personal situations do not allow it. I think you have every right to just say, I'm sorry, I don't have the time in the next month to do it. Uh, but, you know, overall, I, it's an activity that I will strongly encourage people to engage in. It, it, it's like reading the journals. Even if you don't do reviews, would, you, would a junior faculty member spend time reading the academic journals? I do. I mean, we should do, do that because that's our job is to keep up to, up to, up to the latest thinking with, uh, and research. So I think it, it's, it's a natural thing for us to be doing. So that's the softball easy question. What about something like a conference? Organizing a conference, you mean, or, yeah. Yes. Again, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm with Julian Birkenshop, they're organizing the SMS conference 2020. And, you know, I've just had this meeting with all the other IG chairs and I told them, thank you very much because you've done 99.9% .9 of the work 
And me and Julia, and we've done 0.01 percent of it. And it, it's at a minute, you know. They had to put all the sessions together. They have to manage the review process. They have to do. And me and Julian, what have we done? We came up with the welcoming memo, welcome to the SMS, and prepare, arrange for six uh, plenary panels. I mean, organizing a conference. I mean, maybe it's different. Samina is sitting there smiling wickedly at me. <laughs> so uh, maybe other conferences are different. You know, I, I organized the Goshal Conference at London Business School. You know, personally, I don't find those time consuming. And I always find that the, the benefits of organizing a conference, of interacting with colleagues, of dealing with the problems associated with the conference, all those benefits outweigh the cost. Right now, you know, I'm learning how to run a virtual conference. When will I ever have that opportunity to get this hands-on experience uh, you know, and and on the same time, get credit for it. I'm learning, and oh, he's the conference organizer. Wow, you know. So I, again, I, I will I will encourage people to think of it not necessarily as a time uh, wasting exercise, but as as an investment in learning, getting to know the community, and giving back a little bit. You know, I'm at that stage in my career anyway that uh, I feel that I need to give back to you know my colleagues. Okay, so we have just about eight minutes left till we let loose all the questions on you. Let's talk a little bit about your involvement with industry uh, and in particular your uh, visits to the World Economic Forum. How did, I, I guess some of that came about through your job at LBS, uh, but any sort of specific advice on how to think about it? How, how might somebody else that's interested in getting involved in these areas and again, the trade-offs involved, not necessarily just yeah. the costs. Uh, I have to say, I did the World Economic Forum three times back in the late 1990s. And then again, two times about 10 years ago. And there has been an evolution in the role that I played uh, in the World Economic Forum. In the early years, I was a content provider. They would say, you the academic, along with two or three other CEOs, why don't you be on a panel to discuss a topic? Uh, which I found useful and, uh, you know, rewarding. The last couple of times that I did it, they, they moved the format and they wanted the academics to be not so much content providers, but to be more like coordinators, mm. to coordinate before the event and during the event, a panel of CEOs talking about something, asking the questions, directing the questions. And I didn't enjoy that. I mean, I thought it was... Uh, uh, placing me into this uh, second class category. We've got the CEOs who know what they're talking about and they can tell everybody. And then you, the academic, you know, you can ask the questions, but you don't really have anything new or insightful to say. Um, so I think that the, 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 given this evolution in the, my role in the World Economic Forum, I, you know, I, I did not really want to continue going there. Having said that, I mean, you know, it's a wonderful forum to be in, especially if you are by nature a networker. And by that, I mean that as with our conferences, the AOM and the SMS and so on, the maximum benefit comes to those that prepare a lot before they come to the conference. They arrange before they come to the conference to meet up with different people to discuss and so on. The first year I went, for example, I just went there and I was, thinking that I will run into Bill Gates in the corridor and start talking with him or I run into famous politicians and they, you know, high five them and, and chat and have a coffee with them. And of course, these people are very busy. They don't want to talk with you anyway. Uh, so it never happened. What you need to do if you ever go there is a identify ex ante who are the kind of people that uh, you want to meet, reach out to them. It's very easy to reach. I mean, the World Economic Forum will provide you with phone numbers and emails to reach out to them. And if they want, they can arrange specific times to meet with you. That, that's one benefit I think that you can get. The second I think is uh, there are many, many wonderful sessions, not necessarily on business, on other mm -hmm. topics, science, uh, the, you know, the climate change, you know, technology, all kinds of things that from very, very good academics or, or, or people in industry that, uh, you know, if you are interested in a broad range of topics, you can sit and hear some really, really wonderful ideas from these very, very good people. So it's, it's a wonderful forum to go there. 
you know, how you hook up with these guys, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I never tried to hook up with them. It's just through London Business School, they came to me and then you know, once they invite you the first time, they invite you the second time, they invite you the third time, you know, it, it kind of had its own dynamic. I don't know if there is a specific strategy that any of us can follow to get on their radar screen, uh, other than, you know, being prominent in what you say and what you, you publish and you come to their attention. So in terms of being managerially relevant, it seems that you've followed many paths. There's the books, there's the Sloan management, HBR types of articles, there's going to World Economic Forum or other industry consortia, and then there's of course teaching uh, executive MBAs. So of all these different ways, you know, what's sort of the way that you see in the future as being the most accessible and the most kind of uh, having the most feedback to also generating research ideas? Um, For me, the generation of feedback, oh, research ideas, if you look at my research, all of my research is phenomenally, uh, phenomenal driven. Uh, you know, we all have different ways of developing our research. I know many people, for example, that look at the literature and based on the theory and the literature, they built up their hypothesis and so on. I always start with a phenomenon and from there I try to understand what's behind it, the theory, the empirics and so on. So for me, interacting with industry has always been a wonderful way of getting ideas, uh, research ideas, uh, and also testing my ideas. Many times as academics, you know, we, we seem to sometimes we get very, very excited about some of our ideas when we talk to each other and so on. But then you go in front of a managerial audience and you say, oh, oh this is what I've discovered. And, you know, people look at you and say, man, you've just wasted a year doing that. It's kind of obvious or it's not interesting or whatever. So testing it with a managerial audience for me uh, has been very, very important in how I frame the questions and, and so on. So it's also, you know, if I could um, give an example from my dissertation, let's say, I mean, many times we think we have an idea and it's valid and so on, but when you talk to managers about your ideas, they ask these simplistic questions, simplistic in, the, in that, like children do, like, like kids will ask you the why question. And if you are really serious of getting their input, it makes you think as to why are they asking that question now? And what does that tell me? And so on and so forth. Uh, just to give you an idea, I, I, when I did my dissertation, I started with this idea that uh, many firms in the United States, this is the late 1980s, okay? Late 1980s, many firms were refocusing. They were reducing their diversification. Okay, so I tried to understand what's the effect of refocusing on their share price, on their profitability and so on. Uh, and then I was presenting it actually to, to managers of a, a group of friends of mine that were managers. And the question they asked me is, yeah, but I, we understand the effect of all this, this phenomenon on our profitability and so on, but why are, are people doing it? Are they stupid? Did they diversify too much in the past? Uh, and my initial reaction was, yeah, yeah, they, they over diversified and now they are reducing their diversification. And as a result, you see the share price going up and you see the profitability going up. And I said, well, why did they over diversify? And it's like, what do you mean why? They, they made a mistake. And the question again is, all of them? All these thousands of people that you business school people teach all the time, they all make mistakes. I mean, what the hell did you teach them? And you know, you, you start saying, well, maybe this explanation that I have that they all made mistakes, maybe it's not the right one, or maybe it's not the only one. Maybe there are maybe other reasons, you know, uh, and it's got me thinking as to well, what kind of other reasons. And, you know, that, that question bothered me for, six, eight months. I mean, I was talking with people, I was reading and I, I just couldn't think. And, and then one fine morning, I don't know how it happened. It just, it hit me, you know, and when it hits you and then you talk to other people, they say, well, it took you eight months for that idea to hit you. Are you kidding me? But that's how it happened with me. I mean, I was one morning I woke up and I said, you know what? Maybe what has happened is that there, there, there is an optimal diversification limit for every firm. Some of them diversified optimally, but something changed over the last 20 years, which reduced the optimal diversification limit, which means that many people that 10, 15 years ago were optimally diversified are no longer optimally diversified. They are over diversified. So it wasn't a mistake. It was that things have changed. And that made, led me, okay, 
what has changed? And, you know, that got me into my thesis, which I think that's the contribution of my thesis, the making the argument that uh, because of increased efficiencies in the labor markets and the capital markets, the benefits of diversification that firms got in the 1960s, they, they didn't get them anymore in the 1980s because, you know, shareholders, for example, could diversify their risk much more easily through the capital market, which is much more efficient now than in the 1960s. So I don't need the firm to diversify anymore. So, and, and you know, and that got me to, you know, the thesis, but key point I'm trying to make here is that what got me there was this interaction with managers who have this tremendous capacity to ask, I think, what we academics may consider simplistic questions, but in reality, if you think about them, force you to rethink how you're thinking and come up with new ideas. So the last question I'm gonna ask for the structured Q&A, and actually I'm gonna steal from Anita. She says, Costas, you once mentioned that your work was managerially relevant, but not managerially useful. What yeah. do you mean by that? Okay, thanks, Anita, for asking that. It's my pet question, this one. You know, I remember for the Koshal conference, we have uh, one of these debates during the dinner, and, uh, you know, one <laughs> academic had to argue that uh, in the field we need more managerially relevant uh, research, and I had to argue that we don't. And I strongly believe we don't need more managerially relevant research. You know why? Because all of our research is managerially relevant. It really is. I, I've done, I can show you empirical research we've done where we've looked at every single article published in SMJ and AMJ over the last three years, and each and every one of them asks a managerially relevant question, comes up with ideas and answers that are managerially relevant, comes up with insights that a group of managers will say, that's interesting. So I don't think we suffer from lack of managerial relevance. We have all the managerial relevance in the world. But I think there's a difference between managerially relevant research and managerially useful research. And for me, useful research is taking, first of all, the relevant insights that your research has produced, combining them with the relevant insights that other people have produced, and recombining all these insights into something that a manager will find useful. You know? And we don't do that as much, it, it's our field. I mean, as academics, you know, our role is to publish uh, an academically rigorous paper. We have to convince our reviewers that, look, the insight or the finding that I'm presenting in this paper, I've tackled it from 20 different angles, and you can trust me, here, here is the data, here's the empirics I did, here's all the sensitivity analysis I did. You can trust me that this finding is true up to that point, and so on. So we have to do that, but and that's important, that's necessary, but that to me is like a brick in the wall. You know, it's another brick on the wall. What the manager needs is the wall. He or she doesn't need it. So it's our responsibility to take different insights and recombine them. The, the analogy I use sometimes is with uh, a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. We as academics, we produce the little pieces of the puzzle. Each one of these pieces is useful and necessary and relevant. But the manager doesn't need the one piece. The manager needs us to put it all together into the picture so that they look at it and say, ah, now I see the picture. And I think, you know, we could get into a discussion as to who is supposed to do that recombination thing. Because as academics, you know, we get evaluated, we get measured by the managerially relevant articles we produce, it's hard enough to produce those. Now I'm saying, by the way, we also need to take those and combine them into something bigger. Who is gonna do that and when are we gonna do that? And, and that, that creates a challenge for our field. Thank you, Costas. That was really, really useful. This is a good time to take a quick break to get a picture. So for those of you that uh, can, why don't you turn on your cameras and we'll take a quick picture and then move to the open Q&A. Maybe have I some should questions. move over to my swimming pool? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll, if, we'll give everyone a second. If you can turn on your cameras, that would be yeah. great. And then I can count to three now so that we're all, good. Uh, we're all looking at the same point in our, on our monitors. 
All right, so I'll say one, two, three, and then cheese, okay? One, two, three, cheese. Cheese. Super, thank you. Okay, excellent. All right, so I've tried to include some of the questions that have come up in, uh, in my questions to Costas, but there are a few that didn't quite kind of fit the stream. So I'll just call upon um, those of you in the audience that have been uh, nice enough to write some questions and remind the rest of you to go ahead and put in your new questions because we have still another 55 minutes or so to go. So why don't we start with Jay, Jay Chalk. I, I believe uh, you had the first question that wasn't addressed. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so it was so really motivated by um, just now, um, Costa, when you mentioned about you were at um, Harvard Business School and you study under Richard Caves. And um, I have this sense that strategy has become more relevant for managers than in the past decades. Um, and we need to be very useful to them at some point. One of the reasons was that um, one of Richard Cave's um, student, um, Peter Navarro is actually, you know, in the White House directing trade policy. And I have friends who are Chinese immigrants in Los Angeles, and they are always pondering about, you know, US-China relations, how do they, you know, um, you know, avoid threats, capitalize on opportunities, move the supply chain and those things. So I was thinking that, do you think that there are any, you know, um, grand challenge type of research questions that are useful um, for, uh, you know, with these uh, US-China tensions rising? Yeah, I mean, obviously US-China relations, it's a geopolitical game, it's a challenge uh, for the next, uh, Century, I think it's the new. You know, we are. Uh, I don't know if the emerging Cold War we're seeing now will continue after President Trump is no longer president and a new administration comes in. I don't know, but uh, certainly, you know, the the the, the tension that you see uh, between uh, China and the United States is is is. I think a, a big one, a challenging one. It's not only an economic one, it's also, you know, geopolitical, it's also um, philosophical, uh, you know, all, you name it. I think it's going to create uh, all kinds of issues for us as academics. So my, my very quick and dirty answer to your question is yes, of course. And I mean, uh, uh, all you have to do is read today's Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and, uh, you know, TikTok, uh, you know, President Trump requires uh, Microsoft or demands Microsoft uh, to give a cut of the money to the Treasury Department. I mean, that in itself raises immediately a research question as to what is the legitimacy of the state in, in asking things like that. So, my, my, I'm not an expert in the field, but my simple and quick answer would be yes, of course, that would be uh, a challenge for our generation, for your generation, not mine, for your generation for the next 30 years to explore. You know, all, all the different kinds of issues that uh, will emerge. I mean, just to give you another example that I'm fascinated by, here in the, in the Western world, in, in Europe, as well as the United States, for example, we keep talking about breaking up big tech, you know, Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon, they're too big uh, and they dominate, we have to break them up and so on. And, you know, as an economist, I will, I will agree with that and I will support that and so on. But at the same time, what you forget is that for every Amazon or for every Apple we have here in the Western world, there is one in China, you know, look at Alibaba and so on and so on. So if we break up our firms in the Western world, do we create an unfair advantage, let's say, to firms like that in, in China? And if it is, you know, should we be breaking up our firm? I think that's a legitimate question for us to be asking. I don't have the answer, uh, but it's something that people may think that I like to explore in greater depth. Uh, and it's a research question that emerges from the tension you just mentioned between uh, China and the United States. There are many other questions like that, in my opinion. Okay, next up we have Michael Leibline. Hi, Michael. Oh, Let Michael, yes. Yeah, I needed to unmute. So, so thank you, Kostas. Uh, this is, uh, all of these sessions I think have been really wonderful. Um, 
and inspiring. And that's my question is going to ultimately be inspiring, but it's uh, chatting with everyone here and and seeing just the curiosity about business and how business can create value for society is is really wonderful. So thank you. So you, what I'm going to ask a question about is you had this comment about inspiring students in your teaching. And that really resonated with me. I mean, I think, you know, to me, so much of what I think I would say is I'm here to teach you um, about more than best practices. I'm going to give you more detail. And so the inspiring comment really resonated with me. The community, the, the notion of community really resonated with me with the full first hour. So I was thinking, I was uh, directed by some of the people, some of the people on this call, I believe, to read James Otteson's Honorable Business. And it really starts with, I mean, I think that could be not just about ethics, but about strategic management and why we need to think about creating value. Um, so I was just putting that together with your comment and wondering, do you have examples about how you think you might inspire your students that I might be able to steal from my classroom? <laughs> How do I inspire my students uh, uh, <laughs> well, next week when I'm online? Thanks, Michael. I, 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 by the way, I, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that I owe you a paper. I promised to send it, but it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> uh, I was glad to see Anita's uh, little note. Yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. How do you inspire people? I think, Michael, if you think about it, I, I consider myself to be in a privileged position. We all are because we are teachers. We are teachers. And we're teachers of young people. I mean, at the end of the day, even if they are 22, 25, 30 years old, they're young relative to us. And they are still forming their opinions and their ideas. And I still and we have that daily contact with these young people. And we have a unique position, I think. We have a unique responsibility as well to influence them and inspire them. So I think one answer to your question, how do you inspire, is to take it upon ourselves that that is our task our task you know the good lord put us in this position you know to in a unique position where people actually listen to us if you think about it maybe it's because of the underlying incentives maybe it's because they they, they need to pass the exam that's why they they listen to us but you know they do listen to us and we have a unique position here to influence people how do you do it if you internalize the fact that you have to do it i think one is by helping them reach out and have more more grander ambitions and goals in life you know uh, for example what what do we teach them now is uh, the importance of not only maximizing share for the value but of making a difference in society now to the our younger colleagues this may come as natural but you know when i started my career 30 years ago it wasn't the case you know i mean the case was your goal is to maximize shareholder value and this is what you do and you know if in the process you destroy the environment or you 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 let everybody be unemployed hey tough luck you know your number one responsibility is the shareholders we change our tune and i think that in itself is helpful in encouraging people to think broadly as to what their role in society is another way of inspiring them is you know as human beings how they interact in the classroom you know so, you know, I would, would use the case method, but sometimes through the case method, you can teach people manners in terms of how they engage in a dialogue, how they engage in an intellectual discussion in an unthreatening way, in a way that, you know, that doesn't intimidate them or embarrass them in the classroom, but hopefully leaves them with lessons like, ah, I've learned something about myself there and so on. And I think the third way of inspiring people is how they think, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I always like at the end of every session to stop for five minutes and ask the students to reflect a little bit. Uh, how did they, from who, from who, what other classmates did they learn in the classroom and why and how? What is it that their classmates said or how they said it or when did they say that, you know, uh, allowed them to make an impact on them? And what does that imply in terms of them uh, as, uh, as thinkers, as, uh, as communicators, as leaders and so on? Um, other than that, I, I, how do you inspire people? I mean, the, I'll stay with that, Michael. I, 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 I never go in and say, these are my five strategies on how to inspire people. You know, you be yourself, you challenge. I mean, I'm, I'm very playful with the students in the classroom. You know, you interact with them, you make them laugh. Uh, yeah, you make them appreciate, look, you know, this uh, risk-free environment, we interact, we exchange ideas, feel free. If you think what I'm talking about is BS, tell me in my face, you know, 
make them be natural and uh, behave like normal human beings. And I think that in itself can sometimes be useful and inspiring to them. I think that's very helpful. I mean, the authenticity is I'm hearing, yeah. you know, we had a call a couple of, uh, there another call we were talking about building community. It's, it's respect for other individuals. I mean, I'm hearing all that and I'm just learning more about that through the richness of your discussion. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Okay, the questions keep coming. Up next is Tim and then Alicia. Hey, Costas. Hi, Tim. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for joining us. Hey, um, you talked about making research managerial useful, managerially useful. How do you do that? Like I said, uh, academic publications need to be managerially relevant. I mean, yes. it's, a, it's, it's, it's the nature of the beast. We have to, you know, no, no journal, I think, uh, the A-class journals, they're not going to publish something unless we spend the majority of the paper uh, on the methods and the methodology and the data, convincing our colleagues that whatever we are saying in that paper is academically rigorous. It's not Costas went up on the mountain and he had a great idea, you know, and now he's communicating it. We have to prove that. However, I think for especially senior people like myself, let's say, it's our responsibility to take these managerial insights and combine them. It's all about recombination. I mean, innovation is all about recombination anyway. So it's taking the insights. Can I give you an example, Tim? Maybe an example will be more practical. But I did just, my, this, it's okay? I'm sorry, just to interrupt. No, I, I, I understood the recombination side, but there are various mediums through which you might do that, like a book, for example. When you say, make it managerially useful. Do you mean write a book or a case note or what do you mean exactly? A variety of, it would be HBR, slow management review, California management review. For example, a managerial outlet publication where that managers are likely to read and so on. That's one. Another would be through our teaching. I think we can, we don't teach academic articles, we teach managerially useful insights and you don't have to explain to the managers or the students that I've recombined all these things to come up with this insight, but whatever I'm teaching you is useful. Another will be, I think, through uh, a, 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 a managerial conferences. I do a lot of uh, conference speaking, for example, industry conference. I stand up and I they say you have 45 minutes to deliver something and whatever I try to deliver, I think, if you, if you listen to any of my industry spe speeches, they are I could have at least 50 references at the end because none of the ideas are mine. It's just taking ideas from other people and, and presenting them. So th th this is what I mean, managerially useful stuff. Uh, uh, a book, yeah, a book will be, uh, I think, a managerially useful outlet because to write a book, I, you, you have to start with, uh, you know, a, a re questions that managers will ask and explain. I just got, I just got a book proposal rejected by a publisher because she said my proposal was too academic. And when I looked at it, it, it just had too many references. I said, why are you having all these things in circles and names of people with dates after them? I mean, you know, it throws me off. Just write in plain English without any references and so on. So, you know, it, it, it managerially useful to me is not only the outlet, it's also how you write. Did I answer the question, Tim? I'm, I'm, maybe I didn't, yeah? Okay. Perfect, yeah. Very good, thank you. Okay. Alicia. Hi, Costas. Hi, Alicia. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing and for sharing, um, you know, your experiences as well as I think your philosophy when it comes to teaching in the classroom. And I think that piece about authenticity is so important. I'm, I'm really curious about how your pedagogy has changed um, through the year. So since you started teaching at yeah. LBS to now. Um, yeah. How has it changed? One major change, Alicia, is that when I started, I was teaching through the case method. Uh, I mean, I'm a Harvard MBA. I, I went through the factory of having to crack up out a thousand cases during my MBAs. I'm a Harvard DBA. I have to, you know, l learn through the case method. So when I started, I was using cases. I don't teach a single case anymore. Not at all. Um, why? Because I found through experience that most people 
do not want to read a 30-page or a 40-page document about a company or an industry they are not interested in to have a debate in class. Uh, at the same time, I find that debating in class is very important. It really is very important. I mean, there's nothing worse than me standing up and delivering, you know, a three-hour lecture, however entertaining, however inspiring. I mean, it's the worst thing. People learn in different ways. They learn from each other. They learn through interaction. We have to have interaction in the classroom. So one of the changes that I introduced was, if I'm not going to use cases to have the interaction, what can I do? And what I do now is a variety of things. I will show them, for example, a, a two minute, a three minute or a four minute video, short videos. I never show long videos, just four, there's a Steve Jobs saying something about what I'm about to teach. Two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, and then you have a debate about the video, for example. Or I will give them a little exercise. I'm, I'm, I'm very good in giving people a little exercise. Again, the exercise has to be short. I, I, I hate half hour or two hour exercises. It's, it's like, here's a five minute or a two minute little exercise. You can do it on your own. You can do it as a team. They do it most of the time. I know from experience they will mess up the exercise. And then when you give them the right answer, you the clever professor who knows everything, you know, then you engage them into a debate as to why did you mess it up? You are bright MBAs, you are captain of industries, you know, and you messed up this very simple exercise that I took from my little elementary school. Why is that? Let's have a debate and learn with that. Uh, many cases, if, if I write cases uh, as part of my research, I write cases, long ones, but what I do, I, I take these cases and I convert them into one page, two page, three pages. So either I ask them to read them the night before or if I feel that the energy room in the room, uh, the, the energy level in the room is not high enough, I'll say, okay, here's a two page uh, case. Take five minutes, go out in the fresh air, read it and come back and we'll debate about it and so on. Games, so th therefore the, the one change I've seen that, that has happened in my, how I teach over the last 30 years is that away from, you know, the case, long cases to a variety of other ways of engaging students uh, uh, in the classroom uh, to have the interaction that I value and so on. The other thing that had to change, I mean, honestly, it had to change because, you know, the attention span of people is, is really short. I mean, I'm fond of quoting this uh, research by a psychiatrist at uh, UCLA who found that the average attention span of the average human being now after exposure to the internet is less than 30 seconds, you know. And if, even if it's not 30 seconds, it, it may be one minute, it may be two minutes, maybe five, it's short. That means that you cannot talk to people about an issue or a topic for too long anymore. You know, I, I, I think of myself like a machine gun. I have to go, pa, 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 you know, from one topic to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other. And so so I, I don't, you know, in the good old days, I used to teach Michael for Porter's five forces in a three hour session. We had three hours of the five forces. Now you start talking about the five forces and like one minute into it, the student will say, okay, you've said it, there are five, one, two, three, four, five, get on with it, man. You know, it's like they, they don't have the patience to go deep into it and so on. So you, I cannot, so right now, if you, if you look at my teaching plan, the good old days, again, the teaching plan got five key segments. I'm gonna do this for half an hour, this for another half an hour and so on. Now, it's like, you know, five minute segments. I'm five minutes, I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna jump to this, then I'm gonna jump to that and so on. Many more topics now and many more, much more variety now. Variety is what keeps people awake. You know, variety is what keeps them engaged. Instead of me talking or do, you do a, a number of things, you know, uh, 10 minutes uh, interactive discussion, then five minutes in your groups talking about it, then one student presenting something, then five minute video, then five minute exercise, then 10 minutes of this, and, and it goes up like this. You hit them all the time just to keep their energy level up and keep them awake. Then, but, you know, you don't have to worry about this. You'll see, you'll discover these things is, as part uh, of, uh, a natural learning process. You know, when, when we get assistant professors in, we sit them down the first year and we say, these are the 20 things you need to do to be good teachers in the classroom. And they go in and they mess it up. 
And you say, what went wrong? Did we not tell you the 20 things you have to do to? And it doesn't work like that. People need to learn at their, at their own pace, through their own tactics, how to implement those 20 things. So you want to go in and as long as you, you are empathetic to your audience, you, 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 you are alert to what's happening in the classroom, you will soon discover that some things you do are good and useful and make you a good teacher. Some other things are not good. And naturally, you will develop your own teaching style that's unique to you. You never imitate anybody else. Never, never, never. You have your own unique style. Be yourself and you'll find it. After trying once or twice or three times, you'll find your own style. Thank you very much. That was helpful. Okay. Thanks, Costas. So next we have Samina with a question. So Costas, you mentioned, no, not the fun, fun questions yet. Those are a surprise for the end. Okay. Um, but you mentioned, you know, you studied under Richard Caves and I'd love to know what was one of the main things you learned from him just as an academic, but also who are your other mentors and what you learned from them? Richard Caves, and again, I'm, 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 I'm turning it to Anita if she wants to jump in and answer. I, I, Richard Caves was the thesis supervisor of Anita. So she knows him much, 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 much better than me. He was one of the four members of my committee. So he's, I mean, he influenced me, but obviously not as much as Anita. But one of the most amazing characteristics of the late Richard Caves is that his encyclopedic knowledge of everything related to IO economics. He was scared. He really was scared. Going into his office, he, you will mention something to him and he will start referencing article after article. Oh, go and read this guy, uh, whatever, you know, General of Industrial Economics uh, in 1973. Go and look at this. Have you read this guy? Have you read that guy? In, in like three, five minutes, you know, the guy will just give you like the whole literature on whatever topic you were talking about and so on. So that was one thing that, you know, I mean, you learn from and you, you, you get inspired by an individual that is so dedicated to his field that he knows, he knows his field. Uh, you know. the, the other thing, you know, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the statement by Richard Case that left a lasting impression on me that, uh, you know, I, I, it's still with me was, I remember I was doing all this empirical stuff and, you know, when you do empirical stuff, you have to calculate variables and, you know, how do you calculate variables? How do I measure the, the innovative capability of a company? Well, you take proxies, you know, and how do you tell, well, let's measure patent count or let's measure R&D uh, spending over sales and so on. And I remember I went into the office one day and I said, look, I'm really uncomfortable with some of these measures I'm developing because, you know, R&D spending, is that a measure of innovativeness, for example? Paid and count, is that a true measure? I mean, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with these things. And Richard K. smiled at me and he said, look, this is empiricism. It's messy. If you don't like messiness, get into theory. <laughs> and he, I don't know, it stayed with me. And uh, it, it made me appreciate that, you know, you, you, there's no perfect solution to anything. You know, as long as you do your best and you try to convince, you know, the reviewers and your audience that look, I have measured this variable to the best of my ability. I've done my sensitivity analysis with different measures and the results doesn't seem to change and so on. You know, if you, the reviewer or the audience has a better idea as to how to measure it, fine. But if not, you have to accept what I have. That made me appreciate that, you know, it's the way to go if I want to be an empiricist. Uh, um, so th that's one, I mean, the, the, the other thing with Richard Cage, I mean, he, until the age of, I think, 88, he stayed emeritus at, uh, at uh, Harvard, he, he, he continued reading. I mean, his, his hunger and thirst for the knowledge, it's, it, it's inspiring, I mean, to find people like that, I think. Um, uh, before I jump on, I don't know if Anita- Anita is here and she has her hand raised. Jump in, Anita. Oh, we can't hear you. Anita, hmm. I can't hear you. Can't hear you, Anita. Uh -uh. Yeah, I still can't hear you, Anita. Hmm. Well, maybe. Well, maybe. Okay. Anita. Oh, she's reconnecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the connection to audio seems to have failed. 
maybe if I can uh, ask the second part of the question that uh, Samina asked, uh, mm -hmm. and then give the floor to Anita. He, she asked, uh, who else, other than Isha Kiesko, inspired me? Uh, you know, uh, the Paul Chorosky, the late Paul Chorosky at London Business School was also uh, one that inspired me in how I do my research, because he's, again, he's an IO economist, and uh, I would write papers together. And one day he said to me, for example, he said, look, you, you guys in strategy, you, you like to argue a lot, don't you? You like to use a lot of words, you know? It's like uh, before, Anita, I'll give you the floor in one minute if, uh, if, you, if you have your voice back, yeah? Uh, I do, I hope I do. Okay, okay. Uh, so Paul Chorosky, he said, look, you write this paper for SMJ and it's like 20 pages before you even get to the data for crying out loud. I mean, I'm bored going beyond page one, get to the data, let the data speak to me and so on. So he's the one that kind of influenced me in, in, in bringing the data a bit earlier into the discussion and, uh, rather than, you know, uh, theory and hypothesis and so on. I mean, I don't, know, I don't mean to overdo it here and so on. We still need to have a solid theoretical foundation before we get to the data. But sometimes you can use the data a little bit earlier in our theorizing to support whatever we're saying uh, and then build our hypothesis. So Paul Chirosky was another person that influenced me. Anita. Well, I was just going to say that, uh, Costas, you, I think you and Dick Caves have many, many things in common. One of them is this sort of just internalized sense of humor and fun about the enterprise that we have together of coming up with these ideas and developing them. I mean, Richard Caves, Dick loved more than anything. He loved uh, interacting with young people. He had great faith in people's capabilities to own the ideas, to develop them, to master the methods, to make things happen. These are all your, your characteristics too. You've had many, many doctoral students and junior scholars. I mean, the question earlier about why you haven't loved, left uh, London Business School, I, I think London Business School would not be what it is without you. You've contributed more than anyone for sure to the development of the institution because of that sense um, just of of how fantastic it is that you can that, that we're doing this together that you can convey to junior scholars and keep keep us you know keep them motivated and your peers and friends motivated uh, to continue and to and to push through a uh, roadblock so that's that's what i wanted to emphasize same thing about paul by the way too paul, paul was the editor of my very first publication and i said to him paul this is so hard i i am not used to the editorial process he said yeah well most people never publish anything most people get phds never publish anything and the fact that you're sticking with it is is so that idea of persistence i think and and commitment is something that you also share with paul Thank you, Anita, for those wonderful words, and thank you for stopping the car while you wanted to talk. Are you driving right now? I am. I am. <laughs> I'm not driving right now. I pulled over. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Anita. We'll see you very soon for your own Meet the Scholar session, so save some steam for that. Um, how are we doing on time, Samina? Should we go to rapid fire or should, do we have time to ask a few more questions from the... We have time for a few more. If you have any from the registration list also, and then, then I can do rapid fire at the end. Sounds good. So I, was, I did some background research before uh, setting up for this interview and I was told to ask Costas about the Cyprus potato case. <laughs> I believe there is some story there that's worth hearing. <laughs> And I almost <laughs> forgot about it, but Alicia's who, who question told you that, me. Uh, Give me the name of my colleague who mentioned that. Uh, they may be and... looking for a job tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, 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 it's just an example of, uh, you know, I think that sometimes you have to surprise students uh, with, uh, you know, what you're saying and so on. And also to make the point that, uh, you know, whatever you are saying in teaching applies to a variety of industry contexts and a variety of companies. So sometimes I'll come up with my own uh, um, imaginary companies that uh, nobody will have heard of or no, nobody will know and say, how about this company? Whatever you're saying, does that apply to that? And, you know, you throw in the Cyprus potato company, for example, and, you know, most people will say, what the hell is that? You know, never heard, never heard of this company and so on. But the point is, 
to, to, you know, to show to people that some of the, what we teach them is, can be applicable to, you know, uh, across time, across industry contexts, across geographies and so on. So it's just a dirty little tool that I use. Uh, did they also tell you to do, for me to talk about the cake exercise? No, but you uh, can. <laughs> I talk about that forever because it's, it's, it's an exercise. I actually stole uh, the exercise from a, a colleague of ours who was uh, um, uh, on sabbatical in London Business School in 1996. It's a wonderful mm. little exercise that uh, you can use to teach a variety of things. Uh, and the exercise is you have a cake and you have a knife and you can cut the cake four times in straight lines. Mm -hmm. What's the maximum number of pieces you can get out of four cuts? And you give this to, I've given it to high school students, to MBAs, to board of directors, people, and so on. The guaranteed, over the last 25 years, guaranteed 99.9% .9 of people will not get the right answer. And then you get into a discussion as to why, what did they do and so on. Uh, and it allows you to talk a little bit about mental models, assumptions on how we think. Mm -hmm. It allows us to think in terms of uh, the underlying environment because everybody tries to solve the exercise individually, even though I'd never said it's an individual exercise. So, and it's one of those exercises that you can use as a brain teaser to break the eyes, let's say of, with, uh, within two minutes or you can use it for half an hour, or I've used it for a three hour session to, wow. you know, as a, as a prompt to teach a variety of things. I've got many of these 30 little tricks. If anybody's interested, send me an email. <laughs> uh, and the last question that I have here is from the, uh, the Q&A, uh, pre-submitted Q&A from the participants. Uh, so as you might've noticed, a lot of the attendees are junior, junior faculty. How should junior faculty think about uh, choosing co-authors and managing their productivity? Yeah. Even though it's not our goal to publish papers. We somewhat yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. No, but we have to publish. So I, I, I always, first of all, I encourage people to choose co-authors. The, the truth of the matter is that the publication game has become so competitive now that in the tenure clock is only seven years. I mean, there is precious little time uh, to get those publications out and get your tenure, especially since now the average review time is, is lengthy. I don't know what it is, but I'm in probably more than two years and close to three years. So if it takes three years on average to get a paper out, imagine if you get rejection, out, uh, one of the reject, two of the reject, ah, I mean, it's, it can throw you off. So to accelerate the process, I think you need to have co-authors. Secondly, I think co-authors are wonderful ways of learning as well and enriching your knowledge and mm -hmm. so on. So it's not only, you know, that you need to publish that you get co-authors, it's also a learning process. I will encourage people to reach out and find co-authors early on. I wouldn't say, you know, even, even for your dissertation work. Many people have this idea that my dissertation work is my own and, you know, and surely, yeah, see if you can publish at least one paper out of your dissertation work uh, because you want to lay claim on that work and say, this is what I did on my own and so on. But yeah, surely if you're gonna get three, four papers out of the dissertation, some of these could be co-authored with other people that can help you. Uh, I mean, I, 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 my advice to people is don't, don't try to, you, to be very instrumental in who you choose as a co-author. Uh, you know, find someone that A, you think they, they compliment you in terms of their research skills or their ideas, and B, you can work with, that you're comfortable with this individual. Uh, they, they are your friends because they will be your friends after uh, all these years working together as co-authors. Find somebody and, you know, uh, exploit the network and see if you can write with the, the other person. I mean, the, what my other colleagues code is that, uh, you know, if you co-author something, each co-author gets 70% of the publication credit. So it's like, you know, more than half. Uh, so you might as well have co-authors. Uh, I, I have, I have co-authors throughout my early on in my diversification work. I had Peter Williamson, uh, a co-author of uh, uh, an SMJ and an AEMJ with the guy, even though his field was not diversification, but he complimented me a lot in terms of his research skills. Uh, I have articles with Paul Cherosky, again, an economist and so on. I, I hope to write something with Anita, you know, uh, we, we, we have uh, 
we have to seek out uh, quotas, in my opinion, because it's efficient, but it's also a great way to learn. Excellent. Thank you so much, Costas. Okay. All right, Samina, the rapid fire questions are yours, and I'm going to send you a secret one through the chat. Oh, excellent. All right. Ready? What do I have to do now, Samina? Explain. What is this rapid fire? These are fun questions, fun, harmless questions. There are no wrong answers. All oh, right. I like that. Because remember, Meet the Scholars is about, we want to learn more about you holistically beyond scholarship as well. Right. So some fun, so I'll start with the easy ones that, that, that you know, that you have heard, I know, in some of the previous ones. So um, what is your favorite dessert? <laughs> apple pie with vanilla ice cream. Papaya. Apple, no, no, apple pie. Well, apple, apple pie. I heard Apple that. pie. Yeah. <laughs> With a vanilla pie. ice cream. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, but now I'm curious. I'm going to try one day papaya with vanilla ice cream. Okay. Um, what kind of music do you like? Yeah, I like uh, easy listening music. I mean, uh, I usually, whenever I'm typing or whatever, I sit there and listen uh, easy listening music. Uh, uh, don't ask me for my favorite singer now. I will name a lot of Greek singers that you, do, you would you would have. I listen to Greek music. I listen to a variety of, but just easy listening. Okay. You, Not rock. Easy, easy, easy listening. I get that. Okay. You've lived in the UK a long time. Are you a rugby fan or a cricket fan? Neither. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a football fan. It, it, ah. it really is amazing. I, I, I follow so, soccer, as you say. But um, favorite football team in Manchester United. Mm. I'm surprised I'm not wearing the Manchester United shirt. Uh, <laughs> it, it's interesting you ask me. You know the Lord's Cricket Ground, which is the national cricket stadium of England. It's about 200 yards away from London Business School. It's a five minute walk, and uh, in, on summer days you will see thousands of people walking by London Business School, going to. The cricket car. I never got into cricket, even though I love baseball. Baseball is my favorite sport of them all. Uh, because baseball and cricket, you know, are kind of similar, but I never got into cricket. All right. All right. So, you must be into cricket. You must be into cricket. You no, know, I'm actually the football fan because I have a son who's crazy about football, but Manchester United is not his favorite team. So I. What I is his team? Tell me his team now. FC Barca. So. FC Barcelona. It's a good team, okay. It's a good you can't team. Can't go wrong. They're, I'll say they're both good. Okay. Um, okay. Here's a question: If you could live in a habitat either in space or underwater, which would you choose? Probably underwater, because it's going to be really, really quiet and uh, cool, and uh, I don't know, have the fish around it. But it's a more beautiful image, I think, of fish wonderful fish and blue water all over the place a rather than aquarium. sorry huh? like living in a giant aquarium right you, yeah, yeah. Space. Okay. Uh, yeah. If, if you could have dinner with any historically deceased figure famous person who would it be no deceased ah oh, this is i was i, I was I'm gonna say right away obama president obama but not deceased uh, deceased person I think Martin Luther King will be up there with the, with the, on, on my list. A very, 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 very inspiring individual. I, I, use, I use him a lot in my teaching, actually, uh, in, in, in about communication, about beliefs, about having a vision and so on. I think John Kennedy will be on my list as well as uh, inspiring uh, presidents uh, who, you know, set visions for people uh, beyond, you know, narrow confines. Uh, Both I mean, and ancient Greek uh, uh, authors and things like that, you know. Okay. Is that good enough? Oh, but yeah. Martin Luther King would be the first one. Martin Luther King, definitely. Dr. Dr. King. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, if you could have a superpower, so let's say invisibility, moving things with your mind, flying, mm. which one would you choose? Actually, I watched this movie where this guy, the famous actor, I can't remember his name, he will take a pill. And that will give him tremendous mental abilities to think like 100 moves into the future and remember anything, learn new languages uh, in like a single day. I, I wish 
Sometimes I have this dream that if I can take one pill like that, I'll publish a hundred articles in one day and then get it over with and, you know, move on, you know, so that, that ability to think uh, uh, more broadly and so on. Yeah. Cognitive capacity, like to the max. Okay. To the max. Uh, yes. And our last question, which is, what do you do to unwind or relax? I play tennis. I'm not very good at it, but I play tennis. I watch a lot of football on television. And I read uh, non, non business, uh, business uh, books, non business. You know, I don't find reading business. Even, even sometimes I pick up some of my uh, own books, and after a page, you say, Oh my God, I'm going to cut my wrist here. You know, it's like, <laughs> give, me, give me something interesting to read, not my own books. Do you, Casas, do you like to read fiction or non fiction when you're reading? I like fiction. I like fiction. But like fiction? I mentioned before, I'm, I like authors like Malcolm Gladwell, I love, I, you know, I, have you read the latest by Malcolm Gladwell, Talking to Strangers? I haven't, I haven't read it. Fantastic, I, 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 it's, it's like 300 pages, I read it in one day. Really, it's, a, it's one of those books you can't put down. That's, That's what I, I say. It up because I won't be able to, <laughs> after Academy, I have a whole list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what every publisher I approach, I say my next book is going to be like Malcolm Gladwell. That's why you have to give me a contract. <laughs> well, on behalf of the division, Pastor, I want to say thank you. Thank and you. thank you for being one of my mentors and role models as well. Oh, la la. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to Nell for final words. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you for having me here. Well, thank you. I mean, this has been so great. We've had uh, incredible questions, incredible insights, really great attendance. I've learned a lot. Uh, I think you've earned your swim, Costas. Thank you so much again for being available. And I will point out, every one of these sessions I've been to, I've seen Costas lock in for a, for a few minutes. So he's done his homework, uh, you know, even if uh, the rest of us don't know it, preparing for this. So thank you for that as well. Thank you, Nana. Thank you all for staying on. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.